So today we're talking about QRM, interference, noise, and other issues. And I've got my good friend, the Smoke and Ape, to talk about this because he is somewhat of a, I don't know, are you an expert on this topic, uh, Ape? I, I would say so. <laughs> I guess maybe. I don't know. Uh, I, I have had a, a, t a bout or two with it, so. You've, had, you've got a lot of videos on trying to reduce uh, RF noise and, and other problems, and we'll get into that a little bit later on in this video series. All right, so QRM, what is QRM? So QRM is referred to in a lot of different terms. So we've got QRM, we've got RFI, we've got EMI, we've got um, any others you can think of, uh, birdies, all sorts of different references, yeah. but almost the same thing, right? Yeah, the thing is, is that it, and everybody will call it RFI most of the time yeah. for any kind of noise or, or, or interference that um, that they're getting. And there's so many things that cause it these days um yeah it, it, there, it, re it really and, can be tough yeah and i mean Q Q so qrm is a is an old radio telegraphy morse code term so that qrm basically means do you have interference that's what you're asking the question for so correct um as you said today in modern society we've got so much noise emitting products because of the you know electronics today um, those that live in city and in the suburbs, especially when you operate, especially on HF, you're quite li likely to suffer those higher level noise issues and interference issues. Why, why HF and not the higher bands? Well, I think that you can get <clears throat> interference on the higher bands, but the, um, the lower bands are more, more prevalent on the lower bands. Yeah. Yeah. More susceptible. And so, um, one of the things that like I've, that I've noticed is, is that you have a lot of equipment these days that is uh, powered through pulse width modulation controls where um, they supply electricity through one of these wall warts or AC adapters that supply pulses of electricity as opposed to constant electricity, which is the way equipment was made back in the day. Um, it's much cheaper to use pulse width modulation to power equipment. When you do that, you create a square wave um, inside your device. And so, most electronics need well electronics need to be certified under part 15 in the united states to guarantee that they don't emit harmful noise that can impact the usage of other things now really what people care about is, is impacting cell phones televisions and stuff like that they don't really care so much about ham radio because there's not a whole lot of us here hmm. but those square waves create a frequency uh, or a signal on frequencies um, the way they work is a square wave is made up of a sine wave and then fundamental frequencies, uh, every odd harmonic of its fundamental frequency. And so you, and, th and that's what's causing the problem that I have. That's why it's every, t every 10, for whatever reason, I have a, a fundamental frequency that something's generating. And then I have harmonics of that that are, that are causing me problems. When you have hundreds of these in your house, even if they're not strong, the, to the, the total or the aggregation of them push push your noise floor mm. up mm. and with hf radio we often are listening to weak signals or low signals that sometimes are in the you know just in or above the noise floor and then even in the case of some digital modes like ft8 can actually read signals that are below the noise floor that you can decode those mm. um, so actually so that's a good point so you mentioned noise floor so a noise a good noise floor is just noise that's generated by nature so atmospherics um the sun all sorts of things that are out right. of our control um and then you want to avoid as much added on man-made noise as possible onto that noise floor sometimes it's unavoidable just because of where you are and uh, and factors outside of your control but it, it pretty much everything inside your home you can <laughs> you can control if you, well you can, sure to some, to some degree because um, every so every electronic device pretty much in the home is an emitter of some kind. So you've got um, you you mentioned the PWM power supplies and switch, you know wall watts and switch mode power supplies. So the other reason they do it is is also for efficiency. So um, they can get the power out of them in, sure. in a smaller package and 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 it's and it's more cost effective as well. But then it's at a cost of RF shielding. The RF shielding sometimes is not as good. And sometimes as well, it's not necessarily the device itself, but perhaps it's a, in the case of a wall wart, it's got a DC lead attached to it. And 
it might be sure. radiating out through the DC lead because it's sh- it's probably shielded, but it needs it acts to come- as an antenna, right? Correct. So you've got this. You've got say if, if I can visualize it, you've got a power a power circuit that's in case say in a metal box, but you've still got this wire coming out, which is your DC lead, and that's where your interference could come down. So we'll talk about trying to suppress that a little bit later on. But what are some of the things? Yeah. So that's a good example. So that's a USB lead with a with a uh, a suppression toroid on it. Yeah, it, it came with these, and you know, I used to get like uh, laptop cords, for example, that would have a AC to DC conversion on a device on them, like an adapter, and it would have these little beads on the cord, and I never knew what they were for. I, I was like, I don't know, maybe they're there for splicing or whatever. But once I started to learn about radio and RFI and ferrite and stuff like that, I realized that these were for noise suppression. Now, a lot of times you'll get a cable like this, which will create noise at a much, much higher frequency, like 800 megahertz, for example. So you do get, you do have this problem in uh, in, in higher up bands, but for whatever reason, it, it's more, you experience more in HF than you than you do like in two meters, for example. So that, that USB cable, just show it again. One thing that's interesting about that though if someone was to look at that, they'd say, but hang on a minute, the cable's shielded because there's a there's a metal shield <laughs> on the right. outside. So why do you need the toroid? Well, that's a that's a good question. Um, the, to, with the, the toroid's not the shield in itself. You're talking about this shielded stuff on Correct. the outside yes. of the cable here. So what I can tell you is, is that shielding, sometimes you have a signal that runs down. This has four pins inside or four wires inside of it. that's how this type of usb works i believe it's got i got four yep. um, and so they run through the center of this and they have the shielding on the outside the outside of the shielding can is something called the skin effect where there will be electrical currents that will run down the shielding and what, it, what can happen is when you have those electrical currents they can move from something that's happening inside one device into something that's happening inside of another device and cause interference that way the other one is that when this becomes electrified, it essentially acts like an antenna and can pick up sounds or vibrations. So what this ferrite does is it actually stops noise that's traveling on the shield. It doesn't do anything for noise that is traveling on the four wires that is inside. It's strictly, at least as I understand it, it's strictly for suppressing RFI currents that are traveling on the outside of the shield. I get if we could call that common mode current as well. So the yes. reason I use that analogy and I saw that cable was because this also applies for your coaxial cable as well. You can mm-hmm. receive noise down the shield of your coaxial cable. So that's why you'll see um, things like this. You'll see toroids. I did a video on this about wrapping your coax around this to form a, a common mode current choke and and to make sure that you don't get that uh, interference or that noise traveling down the shield of the cable. So with the QRM that you've been talking about, you've got the the the, the pulses and you've got the uh, carriers every 10 kilohertz, but you've also got stuff such as hash, you've got clicking, sure. all, all of these things that sort of sound electrical. We're not talking like lightning crashes and things like that, but... Right. Yeah, anything that sounds that's pr- pretty much con- like it can be constant or it can disappear. So that's essentially what QRM is. Um, now, some of the steps to identify and track it down um, is yeah, have a listen to see what kind of noise it actually is. Um, a good thing to do is to take a journal of the times when you notice the interference. So sometimes it might only come during the night. So you could say, okay, well, maybe it's a plasma TV or if it comes on in the daytime but not at nighttime, you could say, well, that possibly might be solar panels because obviously... Yeah, I was convinced it was my neighbor's solar panel. Yeah. Mostly because I don't so, like so, my neighbor. But the, but the, <laughs> so, did your noise dis- so did your noise disappear at night? Um, it did not. So, But the thing is, is that I don't, I don't have the noise 24 hours a day. But I have it most of the time. So whatever it is, it's it, it, it does come and go. So like that rules out a lot of things because like um, one of my friends had a problem 
and it was the clock on their on their oven. So when their oven was not being used, but that clock was powered up because the the cable was plugged into the wall, the two twenty outlet, it was causing causing some kind of problem. When he when he finally tracked it down and unplugged it, he goes, even though it's not on, I'm going to unplug it. Unplug the the oven, clock goes off, go, the the problem goes away. Now, maybe it wasn't the clock and it's some kind of, I don't know, some other electrical component in there that's charging up and discharging and storing power or something like that. But uh, for whatever reason, it uh, it stopped when he unplugged it. So some of the other steps to identify and find that QRM uh, you mentioned as well. So sometimes where your antenna is located, if it's located in the near field or close to the house, it's probably a good indication that you could be getting direct coupling mm. between the interference and your antenna so you could try moving your antenna a little bit further away from the house um also yep. as we mentioned where the coax is run as well yeah so like um i did think that that was like likely the coax picking something up from the ac unit that i that i had outside but uh, one year uh at christmas time i was operating and all of a sudden uh, my my wife is like I heard a really loud click and then all the Christmas lights went out. And so I was tripping my RFI protector that, uh, that the Christmas lights were powered into. And then one time, even when I was doing it, it tripped the circuit in the garage. So I had to go out there and do that. <clears throat> so not only do your radios, they're victims of this RFI or this common mode current or whatever you want to call it. They can also be culprits that can cause other problems. So there are uh, circuits, circuit breakers in your house. There are certain brands that are extra susceptible to RF interference. And, uh, you know, you could cause problems for yourself or even your neighbors and get in a little mm. bit of trouble. Yeah. Uh, I guess the first step to do is to, and I'll, we'll go into this a little bit later on, but the first step is the things that you can do in your shack first before you start to venture out towards yeah. finding you know, the other culprits, because then you become, you become a clean, a clean user of the RF spectrum. So, which is always a, a handy thing, especially when it comes to neighbors as well. Um, so some of the other things that you could do is you could use a small, uh, so you used, a, I think you said you used a tiny SA, but not mm -hmm. everyone might have that, but most people have a small AM receiver. So you yep. can go around the house with a small AM receiver. In fact, I think even my Yesu, so I've got a VX, I've got a VX8. Um, yeah, you can pick up I, AM, right? Yes, yeah, so, so some handhelds can pick up AM, and all you have to do is you just need to walk around the house and just with the antenna just go near and hold Probe. it near. Yeah, yeah, just hold it near anything that you might think might be interfering. So those wall warts are the biggest culprits, uh, lead lighting, and just see if you can hear. And if you know what normal AM sounds like, if you start to hear or buzzing or whatever the case is, you know, okay, well, I need to look into that, and you can make a note down that you'll, you know, check out that device later on by either unplugging it or, um, you know, doing something like that. Well, you, what you can do is you can turn the circuits, the, 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 the breakers in your, in your um, patch panel downstairs, in, mine's in my garage, you can turn your breakers off one room at a time and then check mm -hmm. and see if the sound went away and that narrows it down to the room. Then you can go into the mm -hmm. room with the radio mm -hmm. and, uh, and see if you can find it that way. Yeah, that was the last step that I had here on the list was when you have, um, if you put your radio yeah on a battery, or even if, you know, if you've got something like a an IC seven hundred five, it's even better because it already has a battery in it. Right. You you can just plug it plug it in, but ideally you want to use the main radio that you have in your shack to to be powered on a battery. Turn off everything in the house. Go turn those things on one right. at a time until you find the specific circuit or what it might be, and then go in and start narrowing it down. The process of elimination, basically. Yeah, Ham Radio Dude actually used his 705 to track down his RFI problem. And I think it was his dryer, um, mm. where he just hooked a little antenna up to a 705 and walked around with it, as opposed to using the AM radio. Mm. Yeah, I've got so, uh, I've, I've got some RF interference that I need to go and track down. It's cropped up, popped up on 10 meters in the last week, so I'm not sure where that's come from. Could be. So, a, that's the thing. Is it could be anything. Like, um, our good yeah. buddy T.O. the other day moved his power supply now he he is always bragging he's like i'm out here in the country there's nothing around here causing me any problems i never have any rfi you boys and he, you know he's always saying that stuff he moved his power supply across the room all of a sudden started getting rfi really really bad and it was making his monitor 
blink and I think he said a light was going on and off in his room. And I'm like, you know what? Good. You deserve that with all that mess you've been talking. <laughs> so um, that's another thing where you can cause these kind of things. Like I have a light that goes off when I transmit on 40 meters. Yeah. Yeah. I used to transmit on uh, 80 meters and I used to get the touch lamps in my parents' bedroom used to flash on and off. So it used to be very frustrating when I was out on 80 meters at about 9 or 10 p.m. at night and they were just about to go to bed and the flashlights were going. It was on SSB peak, so every time I'd hit an <laughs> SSB peak, it would flash on and off. So I'd either get the parents saying, I want to read a book and I can't because you're transmitting and I, or that just unplug the light. So. Well, I mean, ham radio is a pretty good hobby. So like, if, even if I'm not into it and the kid's trying to do something like that, it'd be hard to give them a hard time about it, you know, because there's a lot worse stuff kids could be doing than playing with radio frequencies. But So if you're having problems with QRM, go in and check out this video over here with Hayden and myself where we talk about different solutions that might help you out.